Hey guys, welcome back. So this video is one that I have been waiting to make for a very long time. And I'm not really sure why it took me this long to make, but it's been one that I've been wanting to do. And I just like, I have never sat down and actually mapped it out and, you know, seen like, okay, what's the real differences between grooming and cosmetology. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to take the time, I'm going to map it all out. I've got the similarities, I've got the differences. Uh, and let's talk about it. <clears throat> so, the first major difference that I noticed whenever I switched from human hair to dogs was the clip-on combs. I swear that was like the first thing I was like, holy shit, this is so different. So like in grooming, you get like all these different blades, like whereas in cosmetology, it's like one blade really, and then you just get your guard combs which is another thing that's like different. Like in grooming, you call it a clip-on comb. In hair school, it's a guard. Um, and the guard makes more sense to me because, and I mean the clip-on comb, like yeah, it's a comb that clips on, but it's still like calling it a comb is like really confusing because like also a regular comb is called a comb. So when you say like a guard, you know like, oh, this could be one thing. And the thing that guards the hair or guards the blade from going too short. Does that make sense? So anyway, in human hair, it's first of all called a guard, and second of all, the numbering system is like, in human hair, it's like literally like 1 through 10, whereas in grooming, it's like, there's like a A, a fucking, G, I don't even know what letters there are, because I always call it by their length, like, I just straight up call it by their length, because the numbering system makes no sense to me. There's like a couple letters, like A, and I want to say E is one of them. Um, and then there's another one. I can't remember. Uh, and then there's like zero, one, two, whatever. It's, there's, I, I've never been able to make any sense out of the bar, the guard numbering or the clipper comb numbering and grooming. It literally blows my mind hole. I don't get it. Uh, so that was the first major thing that like when I started grooming, I was like, what the fuck does any of this mean? So that's why I just got the exact measurements of how long it is. So then I know like, oh, this is a half inch. So when I pick up uh, that light blue guard, that's really long, that's an inch. And that's what I think. Like, so I'm not like this is the A or whatever it's called. Um, it's easier for me to just remember the length. So that was the first thing that I was like, what the fuck is this? This literally makes no sense. Uh, the next thing that was a major difference for me Coming And I, I should have said this already, but just so you know, I'm a cosmetologist that went to dog grooming. So I did cosmetology first. So this is kind of coming from the perspective of somebody that was like introduced to grooming that was very used to like human hair. And so like, I'm like, what the fuck is going on over here? Uh, but it, it's awesome. I love grooming. There's a reason I stayed grooming and didn't go back to cosmetology. But um, regardless... First thing I really noticed, now in human hair, your shears are typically about the size of your hand. My shears were typically about six, I think that most of mine are like six and three quarter inch. No, 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 that's too long. Six and a quarter, I think is what it is. Like one fourth, maybe. Maybe I do six and a half. I think mine are six and a quarter right now because I think the three fourths, they could be a five and three fourths. But anyway, they're about six inches are my typical like hair cutting shears. You go for about the size of your hand. Now grooming, you would be there all freaking day if you had like a six inch shears. Like some of us do, like I have a 6.5 that I use for like in between the eyes, but I wouldn't use that for like almost anything else. Um going up to the bigger size of shears just makes more sense for grooming because you can cut more hair at one time. Whereas in cosmetology, like you're just more focused on like how much strain is on your wrist. Um, there's a lot of things that are different when it comes to that. Um, but I want to stay on track so that I don't get too off because I know that's later on the list. Uh, so also for cosmetology, like I said, you have one main blade length, whereas in Grooming, you have all over the place. You have a seven, a ten, a three, four, a three and three fourths, a four, a five, a six, a eight and a half. I mean, all over the place. That's what I mean. There's like no rhyme or reason to it. It's just do it. If somebody can please explain to me what any of the blade numbering or clip on comb numbering means, I'm still like clueless. I don't get it. Somebody explain to me, please. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so, all right, let's see. Oh. Obviously, this is a major difference between human hair and dogs. 
Uh, humans, if you're a human cosmetologist, uh, your clients hold still. And you think, like, they don't because, like, okay, in humans, and if you're a groomer, this is news to you probably, but when you do this on a humans, you'll, you'll be like, all right, hold your head like this. And then they'll be doing it, and then they'll be talking, and then they slowly, like, move their head up, and then they're back to where you, like, put them. So humans do move as well, but, like, if it were a dog, you would put them here, and they'd probably turn and, like, bite or, like, be like, oh, what was that clipper noise near my head? Now I'm scared. It's like that's that's what you get from a dog. So, like, with a human, yeah, they may move a little bit, but nothing like a dog. They're not going to turn around and bite you or anything crazy like that. So, uh, the and, yeah, that's what I put. So, for the dogs, I just put the clients are wild. So, they will poop and pee on your table. They may poop on themselves right after you got them clean. Uh, they really like to, like, fuck you up. They'll try to move last minute while you're, like, trying to scissor something and now you took something too short and now you've got to blend it and they, like, almost fucked up their own haircut. Uh, a lot of stuff that you would not be dealing in the hair salon. That meme about, like, why your dog's hair costs more than yours, that basically all those reasons on that list are the reasons that I think that grooming is more challenging than cosmetology. Now, cosmetology, they do, like, serious color jobs. Like, especially with all this shit, like, all these trends with hair, like the holographic hair and um the people were doing like gray like the titanium almost color for a while that's hard to achieve there's a lot of like trends like fashion colors rainbow hair that's time consuming that's like their version of a doodle is when somebody comes in and wants rainbow hair or something so like for us like doodle is a lot of work and for them like a rainbow head would be a lot of work so um there's that's one of the similarities is like we do have similarities like there are similarities there so uh but there's a lot of differences as well uh so the next thing scissoring styles are very different in cosmetology you're gonna get your little section you're like eight an eight inch or eighth of an inch section pull to the end and snip Whereas grooming is a lot more freehand. You're like brushing up and standing back and scissoring down a leg or something. Or you're like holding a chin and scissor up and like kind of scissor around the face. Whereas like if you were a cosmetologist, you'd probably be like grabbing on the face and then scissoring out. But we know as groomers, like we can't do that. The dog will move. It will not be come out. It will not come out even. Some of I have seen groomers pull like the top knot up. And scissor across there that's like one area we could do it but that's pretty much how your cosmetologist cuts your hair is picking up and then scissoring whereas we do a lot of freehand stuff like brush it out and then scissor it from the side kind of stuff like we don't sit there and pull it out like co uh, cosmetologists do and cut it down does that make sense uh so that's like a major difference um and like i said like a lot more freehand technique with grooming like I remember I was a little bit intimidated by the amount of freehand stuff I had to do whenever I first went to grooming. Uh, the next thing, as I mentioned, color is really complicated. That's like their doodle groom, like their equivalent of a doodle groom. Color is their doodle grooming because a lot of times color is really complicated. People like to lie about what's on their hair. Like they like to say, oh, it's virgin when they actually have colored it before and they don't realize they fuck up the cosmetologist's entire formula when they are not truthful. It's kind of how like with us that they come in and they're like, oh, like they weren't matted. They must have just stuck their head out of the window on the way here or the, oh, we went on vacation. That's the famous line. Oh, we went on vacation and we got back and they're magically matted and blah, blah, blah. Their equivalent of that is the people that they're like, oh, is your hair virgin? And they're like, yeah, it's virgin. And it's not. So virgin hair means no dye has ever touched your head before. Period. That doesn't mean you dyed it one time a year ago. Guess what? A year ago growth is probably to about here. So that means what happens up here is going to be different than what happens down here if you have a year worth of growth. So virgin hair means virgin hair. That means you've never done anything to it. If you've done something to it, any chemical process, period, then your hair is not virgin anymore. So don't lie to your cosmetologist. We're not judging you for your virgin hair, okay? If anything, the virgin hair is a rarity. It's a unicorn. So we don't see a lot of virgin hair. So, like, don't lie to your stylist and say you have virgin hair when you don't. And don't lie to your groomer and say your dog's not matted when you, we both know it is. You know what I'm saying? So, anyway, we, we deal with that. That's similar, but it's two different things. Anyway. Uh, so, the next thing, um, and I put the color is complicated, and then in grooming, there's no need to color. Like, obviously, there is creative grooming. That's a thing. So, if you want to color, you can. Uh, but there is no need for it. Whereas, in a cosmetologist point of view, like, you would... 
I mean, unless you're just a barber, like if you're a human hairstylist, like a cosmetologist, then you probably, like you'd be stupid not to do color. Unless you just are like amazing at haircuts and that's your thing and all you do all day long is haircuts. And I'm not saying you can't do that, but I'm just saying a cosmetologist's moneymaker is more so their color than anything. Just like doodles can be a moneymaker for us when we charge accordingly. Anyway, the next thing um, is there is required schooling and licensing in the United States for cosmetology. Now, I found out in the UK, I know that they do not license for cosmetologists, and that may be true for other countries as well, but in the United States, you do have to be licensed to use color on a client. Uh, and I think there's good reasoning, reasoning for that. I think that cosmetology should be licensed. I think working with chemicals is very dangerous and we need to know what we're doing. Um, and you can not only like just break people's hair, but you can also um, cause severe chemical burns if you are using things improperly. So I definitely think there needs to be schooling. Uh, but in grooming, as you know, there's no required schooling or licensing. You can go get uh, certified and, you know, test under people and yada yada. But there's no required schooling or licensing, no required continuing education, nothing like that. Uh, the next thing is that groom, or cosmetology focuses a lot more on ergonomics and client interactions. Whereas grooming, it's kind of like a joke about how we like do like crazy moves to like do the dog and stuff. And it's like, Okay, so in hair school, you're taught to make your client move because you're the one that's uh, taking the toll at the end of the day. So if you need your client's head like this, they're going to be okay for 20 minutes while you do that. Whereas if they're holding their head like this and you need to see down here and you're doing some weird body movement to try to see what you're doing, it's going to take a more of a toll on you than it will on them to just hold their head to the side for a minute. So for cosmetology, we're really – we're – we are taught to make our client move in our favor. Whereas in grooming, it's like we move in our client's favor. Uh, so the way that we can help with that is to make sure your table is adjusted, make sure you have floor mats, all of that. Uh, we'll do another video that focuses more on ergonomics. But in cosmetology, it's one of the most important things is ergonomics. Um, because that is what keeps the longevity in your career. If you start throwing ergonomics out the window, you're going to beat up your body and you're really going to shorten your career span. So there's just more focus on that. There's also more focus on customer in interactions. Groomers kind of have this like perception that for some reason, like they're like, oh, I work with dogs. So I don't work with people. Like, well, all of those dogs have owners that you do have to talk and deal with. Um, they're not going to bring their dogs to you if you can't even communicate with them and they're not comfortable with you. You see what I'm saying? So you cannot just go to grooming and be like, oh, now I don't have to worry about clients anymore. Like I don't have to talk to people anymore. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. And if anything, you need to be a little bit more convincing because they're not sitting there talking to you for an hour getting to know you. You need to like basically prove to them like, hey, like I know my shit. I know what I'm doing. You know, whatever. So client consultations are really important and I'm like really, really surprised to see how a lot of groomers act like they're not. Um, yeah, I feel like I've talked about that before, so I'm not going to harp on too long about that. But do your client, client, com <laughs> client consultations. Um, okay, so the next thing, I kind of touched on this earlier that there's like one main blade that cosmetologists use and then they just use the guard combs. Uh, so a lot of the cosmetologist clippers are not t detachable blades like ours are for grooming. Uh, so that's why, like, because we don't, they don't really switch out the blades as much. They're not as worried about the clippers getting hot because most of the time they're using a guard over it. Um, and also if the blade were, was getting hot, their client could speak and say like, hey, that blade's kind of burning my skin. Whereas in dogs, they don't have that ability to speak up and say when something's bothering them. So we have to remember to check our blades. Uh, so... <clears throat> Yeah, like I said, uh, um, the human hair blades do not have detachable blades. Oster makes one that does have detachable blades, but that's more of like a barber thing. My dog's acting like he's going to bark, so I may have to pause this video for a second. Come here. Max, come here. <laughs> We're not doing that because uh, there's nothing going on, so he doesn't need to – he doesn't even need to get like that. Just, just sit down, honey. Um, he just like all of a sudden jumped to attention, and I knew. Come here. Sit down. Sit down. 
you need to calm down. I can just tell you're just too much. You're looking for something to bark at and there's nothing. I'm looking out the window too and I can assure you there's nothing out there. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, detachable blades and non-detachable blades. I think we get it. Uh, so the next thing that's a major difference is uh, there's state board regulations for your cosmetologist. So what that means is that state board can walk into any shop at any time and do a audit, essentially. Um, so that's not something that we would have to worry about in grooming shops unless they did a state board and approved something like that and had a state board team to go and check grooming shops. Now, this is not something that human stylists deal with very often, but it is something they have to be aware of because state board is allowed to drop in whenever they want to. So this is a bittersweet type of thing. So yeah, it, state board's a pain in the ass and they're obnoxious, but if you ever ended up in some sort of issue, so say you used a product right and you used it the right way and everything and like somebody tried to take you to court over it even though you did everything the way that you were supposed to do it state board will actually like help you fight in court like they have your back whereas like cosm uh, grooming like nobody's gonna help you it's all on you if you have a bad reaction and that's why I'm so annoying about the whole like people need to list ingredients thing um, because like they're basically leaving us out to dry whenever they um, do that and they don't provide the ingredient list like if we got sued I'm sure they wouldn't back us up and we'd just be screwed and we would take the hit and it would be our business that takes the hit and all that so that's why I'm kind of annoying about ingredients because you know like I said we don't have that same protection that cosmetologists have and even as a cosmetologist I was very aware of ingredients and stuff that I was using so um, like I said, it's a bittersweet thing because um, we have more protection, but also they can come audit us, which is not fun. And that also means we have testing. Please stop licking my hand. <laughs> uh, the next thing, um, oh, and to speak on that, because groomers do not have a state board, by the way, that's also another reason why it's so easy to screw us on pay and to have us as illegal 1099s and all of that. Um, because there's no sort of regulation for it, no standard, uh, that means we can kind of get jerked around when it comes to pay. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not, I like, I'm not saying that cosmetologists don't get screwed, but because there's more of a standard there, they're less likely to get screwed, if that makes sense. So that's kind of another thing. Um, and then the last uh, difference between them is Cosmetology is just way ahead of grooming. I'm just going to be honest. I, there's no reason to sugarcoat it. Uh, grooming is like almost 100 years behind, literally. Um, so some things they're more current on than others, but, you know, there's a lot of things like that groomers are like way behind on. It usually like something will drop in the cosmetology world and then it takes a few years to get into the grooming world. One that like in particular that really made me laugh was like I was listening to this like podcast and they were like, oh my god, there's like this revolutionary new tool out there, this new brush that's called a vent brush. Vent brushes, if you're a cosmetologist, you just laughed. Like, vent brushes were literally invented in the 1800s, okay? Like, the fact that groomers are just now finding out about vent brushes just really shows how far behind they are. So, um, it's interesting because, like, groomers, like, I've noticed a lot of groomers don't give cosmetologists a lot of credit, but then also, like, they don't realize, like, how far behind they are. Max, please stop licking my couch. Does anybody else's dogs do that? They just, like, lick their couch over and over and over. It's literally the most annoying thing. Um, so, anyway, those are, like, the major differences between grooming and cosmetology. But now I want to talk about the things that are the same. So, um, scientifically speaking, human hair and dog hair are made up essentially the same still the cuticle, still have a cortex, all of that. Uh, but the difference is, is we have one hair per follicle where dogs, especially dogs with undercoat, can have like seven to 12 hairs per follicle. Uh, so they obviously are going to have more density than we are, um, which just means more hairs per square inch, really would be more follicles per square inch. So the follicle is the thing that holds your hair in your head, right? And that's where all that shit's going on. That's where like your oil glands are and your sweat glands and all that. They're in your follicle. Okay. So like I said, that's going to be follicles per square inch is your density. Okay. Um, and like I said, the science for cosmetology and grooming is very similar. Like when you really break it down and look at them back to back, like hair is hair is hair. Okay. So 
the stuff that works on human hair, like the same rules that are for human hair, typically apply in dog grooming. Not every single time, but oftentimes the same rules apply. Uh, another thing is the cleaning procedures. You do need to be a little bit more aware with dogs because you don't want dogs to react to everything. You want to be a little extra careful. But as far as like sanitizing, disinfecting, and sterilizing go, it's all going to be pretty much the same across the board. Um, the next thing is typically you are now, okay, this is actually something that's kind of different. Like with, um, well, I guess with human hair, it is with the grain and with going against the grain, but it's like a little bit more like you got to pay more attention in grooming because like you, like you're more focused on going all one direction, whereas cosmetology can go like kind of around the place like if you have like one section that needs to be shorter you can flip your clipper around and just you know go it's like a little bit less precise when it comes to like clipper work for cosmetology than grooming because dogs like have weird growth patterns um so but it is the same along the lines of being aware of the growth patterns like and both you need to be aware of how the growth patterns are um so the next thing is similar skin conditions like they can get ringworm and all that stuff um and I'm sure dogs can get contact dermatitis I, th I think there's actually a lot of things that carry over between um and then similar problems with the hair like they still get split ends like their hair works very similar to, similarly to ours so they need conditioner just like we do and like those kind of things they're all very similar they they have a cuticle the, as their outside layer of hair we have a cuticle as our outside layer of hair so there are a lot of similarities there um another thing i spoke on this earlier a little bit but both jobs are very exhausting uh they're the whole like why the dog's hair costs more than yours that's more talking about like a haircut because when you get in color territory i assure you your grooms are not going to cost as much as their color because we're talking about like you know a three to four hour haircut if we're talking about a doodle um whereas like a color process a serious color process could take literally all day like eight to ten hours so um they're both equally exhausting um, I would say you're going to be just as tired after both, just in different ways. Like, whereas, like, like in cosmetology, if you're doing an eight-hour color process, you're going to, your body's just going to be tired for, from standing in the same way, doing repetitive things all day. Whereas if you are grooming dogs, your body hurts in a different way because, like, we are so hard on our bodies. Like, we are being, like, like I said, we move for the dogs and we just put a lot of strain on our bodies. So I'm a different type of exhausted after doing dogs than I am after doing human hair. So anyway, um... Both, we both deal with crappy clients. Like, they deal, like, cosmetologists deal with people that come in with completely unrealistic expectations about what their haircut and their color can do. Um, you know, you, you hear the whole, like, people want to go from black to blonde. They really do, and they want to do it all in one session, and they want it to be perfect, and they don't want their hair to break. It's unrealistic. Just like when people bring us a matted doodle, and they're like, just leave it long, they get pretty much the hairstyle equivalent, which would be, like, I want this, like, unachievable color and I want it in one day um or you know a lot of people will get to like um we are on the age of social media and there's a lot of filters and stuff on things so people will show people like oh I want this hair color but it's actually like under a filter and there's no way the hair really looks like that kind of thing you know a lot of stuff like that so that's we both deal with shit customers and we both deal with bargaining um so I actually just saw one of my hair school friends the other day posting like, no, I don't have any fucking deals for you. Like, you just got to pay like everybody else. And that's, that's, I mean, we both deal with that. We both deal with customers that want to bargain. In fact, every place that sells things, period, deals with bargainers. Bargainers are just a thing of the world. So we are all going to deal with that. Um, we are also busy during the same seasons. Like Christmas and Thanksgiving is busy for both of us. And any holidays like that, we are going to be busier. Um, the only thing is we may be busier during the summer with our shave downs than maybe somebody else because like maybe stylists, like I would imagine not as many people are going to get their hair colored over the summer because they're going to the pool, there's the chlorine, it's going to fade, so on and so forth. Um, but as far as like holidays and stuff, we are busy at like the same times. Um, and 
like I said earlier, but I want to finish on this point, we have, it's the same theory, like the same like rules of cosmetology pretty much apply in grooming. Um, they really go hand in hand and we could really learn from each other. So if you do end up as a groomer, if you end up with a cosmetologist client, just know they can understand better than like maybe you think that they can. Like they get the chemistry of the hair. You've just got to explain to them. Like, and what I would do if you get a client that's a human hair stylist that has a severely matted dog challenge them say would you take like how would you feel if one of your clients went three months you know or four months so we've got to make it a long enough time that the dog would be matted and gross right so say that your client your human hair client went three four months without brushing or washing their hair and they come in as a giant rat's nest like packed down to their head what would you do would you stand there and brush it out or would you shave it? And honestly, most stylists would probably say they would send them home. Well, we don't have the luxury of sending them home. I mean, we do. We can send them home. But most of the time, like when people bring the dogs to us, they just expect that we're going to do something with it. And if we're going to do anything to it, we're going to take the least painful method. So as a stylist, if you were watching this and you have a dog that groomers have told you are matted, because I actually saw like on Facebook the other day that people were talking about matting like it was like a made up myth by groomers. And I was actually horrified. I was like, no way. But people really think that. So if your dog, a groomer has said that it's matted. And you think to yourself, you know what, maybe I did let it go four months without bathing it or brushing it or doing anything to it. I mean, just be realistic. You would not, like as a stylist or as a normal person, you would not want to sit there and brush out somebody's hair that had not brushed or washed their hair in several months. And that's literally what you were asking your groomer to do when you bring in your nasty dog. Um, they don't want to do it any more than you do. Our regular clients as groomers, like my clients are all on a four to six week schedule. They're never nasty. They don't ever stink. They don't smell like dogs. So I don't deal with a lot of nasty dogs. Um, and if you bring a nasty dog into the shop, like, yeah, I'm going to think, like, what the heck is going on here? Um, so just keep that in mind. Like, if you do have a dog that somebody said is matted, first of all, matting is not a myth. And I can't believe that people would even think that's, like, something that groomers are making up. Matting can be very severe. It can cause dogs to lose limbs, tails, ears, etc., um, and when they're severely long and matted, you cannot see what's going on with their nails. Their nails can grow into their paw pad. Um, and like I said, they can literally lose limbs. Like the matting gets so tight on their skin that it actually cause, it makes them lose circulation. So they can like lose their freaking arm or foot or whatever. Um, I've seen many a story where a groomer was shaving a dog and a tail or an ear came off in their hand. It's horrific, but that's something that groomers actually deal with. Um, so that's why groomers have to charge a lot. And just like anyone else, we have to charge what we need to make to pay our bills and also cover our overhead and all those things. So anyway, grooming and cosmetology, we are very similar, even though we're different. Um, I think that it would be fairly fantastic if we could get these two communities to work together because I think that we could really help each other. There's a lot of hairstylists that have dogs or have clients that have dogs that, you know, they might be a good line of defense if, like, they have somebody, they see somebody with a matted dog or whatever, they could, like, say, like, hey, you know, you should take your dog to the groomer or whatever. You know, we could help each other out. Um, but let's give each other credit because there are a lot of similarities. Um, but there's differences, too. So there's some give or take with both. Um, but I think they're both great careers for the people that do them. Um, I just thought that this might be an interesting video. I thought maybe you guys would want to know, like, what are some things that are similar? What are some things that I thought were really different? You know, things that I was kind of shocked by, all of that. Um, but I am really happy with my decision to switch to dog grooming. Uh, people here was not for me. Uh, I didn't enjoy sitting with people for like four plus hours to do color services. Uh, and yeah, people are a lot more picky than dogs. Like, I don't know. Like, there's there's a lot more pressure that comes with cosmetology. Like, okay, like, you know how, like, sometimes, like, if you're doing, like, a haircut, like, you cut something that looks short, but, like, you have a plan for it. Like, have you ever had, if you're a stylist, I'm sure you have, but you've had the clients where they're like, um, th this piece you just cut, I, I think it's, like, too short. And you're like, just 
calm down a second. It's going to be fine. Like, let me just finish what I'm doing. But so you get that annoying stuff that you would not get in grooming because the dog's not going to be like, uh, you were going a little short right there. I'm like worried my mom's going to be mad at you. Like, you don't get that. So there's like less pressure with that. There's definitely, like I said, pros and cons. Um, but like I said, I hope it was interesting to you guys knowing what the differences are. Um, if you have any questions, um, either way about grooming, if you're a cosmetologist or about cosmetology, if you're a groomer, please comment it down below. I'd love to chat about it. Uh, and yeah, I hope you enjoyed the video and I will see you in the next one. Bye.